devoted to the Jewish family and Jewish learning. We want to gratefully acknowledge Steve and Alina Mayer for sponsoring this session in particular. We're grateful for your continued support. I'd like to start with some stories that women have shared with me, which I think illustrate the struggle and the tension that we might feel when asking ourselves the question, do we wanna have more children? And obviously I speak to more women than men about the, their deepest feelings in their heart of hearts, but I actually believe that these, this tension and this struggle exists for men as well. You'll see one of the stories that I will share with you parallels almost exactly the story in the Gemara, where it is actually Rav Chia, a man who feels this way. In any event, story number one is a woman who called me as she approached her 40th birthday, and she just felt like she wasn't sure. She, she understood that she wasn't ready to leave the childbearing years behind her, but she was afraid of tempting fate. She knew that as she approached her 40th birthday, her chances of miscarriage and birth defects was rising. And she wasn't sure what the right decision was in terms of weighing and balancing those two factors. Another woman shared with me that she struggles with this feeling of guilt and um, perhaps a lacking in herself because she feels so blessed for the healthy, happy children that she has and she feels like they were such a gift from Hashem, from God, and yet she doesn't want any more gifts. And she feels perhaps that's being an ingrate. Perhaps, you know, there's a lack of faith if she doesn't want to accept God's gifts as God sees fit to give them. Another woman I spoke to felt absolutely no struggle, no conflict, saying that she was done with having children and she wanted to focus her entire energy and time into raising the children that she already had in the way that she felt was vital to the children of today. She told me, it's not like our parents' generation where you would just send your kids out on a bike and say, ah, oh, don't worry, just be home before dark. You know, our parents didn't understand learning differences. They didn't understand social skills, bullying, all sorts of things that we deal with that we put time and effort into raising our children with and, and into helping our children and supporting our children with. It, the, raising children today is not like it used to be. And the last story is a story a woman told me about an experience she had many years ago when her children were taking piano lessons. And one day at the lessons, she got to speaking to two of the other mothers. And one of the mothers said, you know, I have one child and I always wanted one more, but for whatever reasons, it never happened. And so we have an only child. The second mother turned to her and said, you know, that's funny because I have two children and I always wanted just one more. But my husband was adamant that we absolutely couldn't do it. And so we have our two children. They turned to the woman who told me the story and said, well, you have four children. You obviously never felt that way, but of course, she said, actually, I do. I always just, I always wanted one more child. The topic we're exploring today is a sensitive one, both for families who've been blessed with fertility and easy pregnancies, and those who've had fertility struggles and health challenges. Jewish children have always been the treasure of every Jewish community, and the tragic losses in Meron last week have only emphasized how precious each Jewish soul is in our family. But Jewish children are not only a longed for treasure, they're also a mitzvah, a commandment, a legal imperative. We don't intend to give a clear and unequivocal answer to the question of should you have more children? When are you done having kids? Nothing we say tonight should be taken as psakalacha, as a legal um, decision or a legal directive for any specific person or situation. What we do intend to discuss are the halachic and psychological ramifications and the underpinnings of the question so that you can have a fuller, more informed, more educated, more nuanced conversation about it with your spouse and with your halachic advisor. The agenda for the session is one, what are the parameters, of the commandment to have children? Under what circumstances might someone decide to stop having children? Two, the session immediately preceding this one discussed contraception within the framework of the medical and halachic implications and complications that might arise. But what we want to talk about is the Jewish framework for a more long-term form of contraception. Number three, is it ever appropriate to put yourself in a position to not do a mitzvah, a commandment? Number four, 
we'll explore why this question is so difficult and offer some practical strategies for this and other difficult conversations. And lastly, we'll explore whether there's ever a time that halacha demands that you stop having children. We welcome your questions and comments in the chat throughout, but we'll be addressing them at the end during the Q&A. You can also reach out to us on, at the email addresses on, our, on each of our source sheets if you need further referrals, further information, or just wanted to get in touch afterwards. You can scroll down on your screen to find the source sheets. So let's begin. Before we start with the sources of the commandment to have children, let's look at source number one, which is the Gemarin Kiddushin. And it tells us that there are three partners in a child. There's the mother and father, obviously, who contribute something. But the third partner that we mustn't forget is Hashem, God. And obviously Hashem is involved in all our decision-making about kids. We can decide we do want more children. We don't want more children. But ultimately, it's not up to us. And I, I think we need to talk about this conversation within that context. So let's dive in. There are three levels to the mitzvah of having children. Number one is a biblical, a deoraita commandment. And then two more that are more rabbinic in nature. So in source two, you will find the source for the biblical commandment, pru urvu, which of course is taken from the verse. It's the words in the verse where Hashem at the right at the beginning of the Torah, right at the beginning of the Bible, the first chapter, we see already, this is actually the first commandment in the Torah, is to be fruitful and multiply. As God creates humankind, he then blesses them. God bless them and God said to them, be fertile and increase, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and master it, etc., etc. Some commentators inter interpret this statement of pru vu as the biblical source, as we said, and some interpret the biblical source as being in a different verse. And this is merely a blessing. And you can see from the verse why that the interpretation makes sense. A beautiful way to think of this mitzvah, of this commandment is as a commandment and a blessing, which of course children are. So pru vu, as we said, is a mitzvah to say doraita, it's a biblical commandment. And the command is to have children. After much discussion in the sources and a lot of back and forth, it's determined to be incumbent on males and it's fulfilled by one boy and one girl who then go on to have children themselves. The second level, the second component is the mitzvah of la erev, again, named after the verse, named after the word in the verse. This verse is in Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, and the Kohelet tells us that just like you don't really know what God's plans are, just like you don't really, you can't really anticipate God's actions, so too, here's my advice, in the morning, sow your seed, plant your seed, and that's the word, don't hold back your hand. Keep on planting even in the evening, meaning have children in, in your youth and then continue having children even after that, because you don't know which will be successful, the morning planting or the or the evening planting, or maybe both. And this principle of La Erev um, reflects the, the reality that we don't ever have a full data set. We humans just don't really know how things are going to work out. And so if we want things to succeed, if we want to be successful in the mitzvah, in any mitzvah, we have to do more than the bare minimum effort. There is a range of opinions about whether the mitzvah of la erev is actually a rabbinic commandment, or whether it is a hidur mitzvah, just an enhancement of the original biblical commandment, or whether it is simply sage advice. In any case, it seems to be incumbent on males again only, and generally is not given a number, but is just, you know, the recommendation is just to continue to be busy with having children. Rav Hankins et al. did feel that a number was appropriate. And he he said that the, because it was rabbinic, it would be styled after the biblical commandment and therefore it would, it would require one more boy and one more girl. The third level is the level of Lashevet, again, taken from a verse, this time in Isaiah, in Yeshaya, where Hashem says, I'm the one who created heavens and earth and my purpose was not to create it for chaos and emptiness, but rather lashevet yitzara. It was created for habitation, for settlement, for, for progress. And the mitzvah of lashevet is actually an overarching philosophy. It's not just related to having children, but it could be related to having a job that has meaning and contributes contributes to yeshuv ha'olam, to settling the world. According to some opinions, this mitzvah of lashevet actually applies to men and women. Certainly everybody agrees it applies to men. 
and it could be fulfilled by either one more or two more children of either sex. Now that we have a sense of the obligation and we notice that it devolves almost exclusively on men, we can start talking about the parameters of women's involvement in the mitzvah. We know that the biblical obligation being exclusively male is what allows us the flexibility in having woman-based contraception. So since women don't have the obligation to procreate, they are theoretically free to avoid it. And all that would be well and good if my husband could marry another wife or two and fulfill his obligation that way. But about a thousand years ago, Rabbeinu Gershom created a ban, established a ban, the Cherem to Rabbeinu Gershom, on marrying more than one wife. And that puts the husband in a bit of a difficult position. And it puts the wife in a position where we really do need to work together. It's not quite so simple to say I'm not obligated and therefore figure it out somewhere else. Now, fulfilling a mitzvah is not the only reason people have children. There's a really wonderful story in the Gemara, right before the story of Rabbi Chia that I'm going to share with you, where a woman comes and says, I want a divorce. I've been married to this man for, you know, 10 years. We haven't had children. And I, I, you know, I, I deserve to get a divorce. And they say to her, well, what are you talking about? You didn't have children. You don't have to have children. What, why is that a reason for a divorce? And she said, what do you mean? I don't have to have children. I'm not obligated. Who cares? Doesn't this woman need a staff to lean on and a shovel to dig? I mean, don't I need somebody to support me in my old age? And don't I need somebody to bury me after I die? And and yes, it's, it's this like very practical um, feminine thing to say, like, wait, crazy man of course I need of course I want children and and certainly throughout history the children were very helpful you know as free labor but I think the idea is that even nowadays when thank God you know we managed to do our work without conscripting the children to it I, I read a great line no one ever complained <coughs> excuse me about having oh excuse me No one ever, oh, oh no. Let's see if that helps. It does not. Okay, you're just going to have to hear me with my froggy voice. <coughs> no one ever complained about having too many grandchildren. And I think our reasons for having children are quite varied and they are spiritual and non spiritual and practical and societal. And I think, you know, there are lots of reasons and lots of lots of ways that children are a blessing. In any event, I want to close with a story about Rav Chia that I promised you. Rabbi Chia was married to a woman named Yehudit, and they had four children, twin girls followed by twin boys. Now, the twin boys were a very difficult pregnancy, very painful pregnancy, and Yehudit decided she really was done. So she disguised herself, she dressed up, and she went to Rabbi Chia and she said, you know, I have a shayla, I have a, a halachic question for you. Are women obligated in pru or vu? Are women obligated to have children? And Rabbi Chia said, well, no, actually, they're not. So she went home and she drank this potion, which made her sterile, made, made her infertile. Eventually, Rabbi Chia found out about it and he said, oh, I wish you had had just one more belly full for me. Meaning, I wish you had just had one more set because our children are so wonderful. The boys are so great and the girls are so great and I'm really sad about it. And you can see how that really parallels that feeling of longing, like I just wanted one more, I wasn't ready yet. Um, but one of the things that I think, you know, we take from this, nobody seems to disagree, none of the achronim, rishonim, achronim, disagree with Yehudit's decision to stop. And I think at a certain point, everybody recognizes that it is appropriate to stop. So what does it look like to stop in a halachic manner? And that's where I will pass the floor back to you, Rabbi. Rivka, thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, I want to reiterate as I begin uh, my comments, um, everything that Rivka said in terms of the gratitude that she expressed. And um, I also want to add two notes. First of all, um, Rivka, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. It's been an honor to work with you on this. Um, and second, general disclaimer for everyone here. Um, on this platform, we can't see any of you. And we're talking about a topic that's very sensitive. And normally I would want to be able to rely on seeing people's faces so I could have a sense of what needs explaining, discussing, wording differently, and so on. Um, don't have that option here. So please, I hope nothing that I say will be taken as glib or insensitive. Um, and you're free to uh, send messages in the chat and Rabbi Mazur as our host will pass along uh, messages to us. Okay, so Rivka outlined the mitzvah of procreation. What I wanna do for the next 10 minutes or so um, is have a technical 
conversation or, well, monologue, um, to talk about what stopping looks like. And I have a source sheet, which as Rivka noted, you should be able to scroll down and find the source sheet. But for this section, I'm not going to read my sources out loud. Um, I also have at the end of the source sheet, a few links to classes I've given, which relate to some of the topics that I'm going to talk about in this, uh, in this section. So when one considers whether to stop or to space um, children, the first thing they need to do is do what Rivka just did, which is look through um, the issues of Puruvu, of procreation, what exactly are my obligations in terms of producing children. But beyond that, the question still is, how do we stop? And there are four different halachic considerations that we need to have. The first consideration is one I'm not really going to spend time on, and that's the issue of hashchatad zera, doing things which will interrupt with the sexual act, and that there was a previous session uh, about the issues of uh, of contraception and birth control and so on, and you can get a recording of that, I think, for up to a year, so you can hear what they had to say about that issue. Um, the second issue is unique to the male in the relationship, and this is what's called in Hebrew, Ptsu Adaka. And what it means is that in the event that a man has a surgery that will prevent him from producing children, specifically a vasectomy, depending on how it's done, it may put him in the category that's called Ptsu Adaka. Ptsu Adaka was actually discussed in the Torah portion that we read this past Shabbat. And the, uh, the rule is that a Ptsu Adaka is not allowed to marry. So in the event that a man had such a surgery and then for whatever reason wanted to marry again, he would be unable to do so. So that's something to consider when we talk about which procedures to have. A vasectomy could have a drastic impact on the male's future. Then you have the third issue. And the third issue is what we call cirrus roughly translated as sterilization. And this is an issue if we were to damage the reproductive organs of either the man or the woman. Um, if you are using the source sheet, you will note that the first source comes from the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. And there we learn that there is a biblical prohibition against sterilizing a male. There is a prohibition which we assume is rabbinic against sterilizing a female. Uh, the Vilna Gaon adds that there may be a biblical law as well regarding sterilizing a female. Rav Moshe Feinstein was concerned about the position of the Vilna Gaon as well. So we can't do something that's going to damage the reproductive organs of the male or the female such that they would not be able to produce children. Now, there may be two mitigating factors which are explored in the sources I brought on the source sheet. Um, number one, what if it doesn't actually involve physical damage to those organs, such as we use hormones that are going to interrupt the action of the body, but don't actually damage the organs themselves. So the Shulchan Aruch writes, the Code of Jewish Law writes, that it would still be prohibited for a male. It would not be prohibited for a woman. And Rav Moshe Feinstein, I brought him on here as well, in source number two, has more to discuss regarding that and where it will apply and where it won't apply. But that's one point, is that use of hormones may mitigate this concern. Second, is that in the event that the act that is performed, the contraceptive act that is performed, is time limited in its effect or is reversible, that may mitigate things. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein in source number three on the source sheet is open to leniency where it's a means of contraception that will have a natural halt. And Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg, in source number four on the sheet, is lenient even where the, um, the, it's a procedure which can be reversed, even if the procedure is not inherently time limited. There's a lot to be said about this issue, but what I want to get across in terms of the discussion of cirrus, the discussion about sterilization, is that we really want to stay away from actions which will damage the reproductive organs. And then the last consideration of the four is abortion. Specifically, if the method of contraception that's used prevents implantation of an embryo, as opposed to preventing fertilization, if it prevents implantation, then you run into questions of abortion. I brought you a piece from the Yoatzot website in source number five, which, uh, which addresses this. Granted that this would be, so to speak, the lowest level of abortion because you're just talking about an embryo that hasn't even implanted, Nonetheless, there are halacha considerations. So those are the four issues that we look at. Number one, are you interrupting the reproductive or the procreative act, I should say? That's number one. 
Number two, look back at my notes to make sure I got them in order. Number two, are you doing something to the male that might prevent him from being able to remarry under the law of Pitsua Daka? Number three, are you sterilizing the male in a way that, or female, in a way that damages their, uh, their reproductive organs? And number four, is there an abortion concern? So translating this to the practical options for how one might stop. Um, generally speaking, birth control pills would be the best. Um, out of the halachic options. The, um, and again, I want to stress here, you have to be talking to a halachic authority to deal with the question of, have I fulfilled what I need to fulfill in terms of reproduction? Not to mention birth control pills have their own complications that, uh, that they can introduce, staining and so on. Um, but those would be the best option because you're not preventing the, uh, the sexual act. There's no physical damage to the reproductive organs. There's no conception and therefore there's no abortion issue. That would seem to be the most preferable. Um, hormonal implants, um, an IUD or, uh, or an implant in the arm, which I've actually read about. So these operate by releasing a hormone that thins out the endometrium in the uterus. Um, they may also thicken the mucus to trap sperm. They may also be involved in preventing ovulation. There are different mechanisms. But the salient halachic features here are that they tend to be temporary and easily reversed. Very, very uh, important. And therefore, they would be um, our second choice after the, uh, the birth control pills. Then you get into intratubal devices where something is inserted in the fallopian tubes to keep the egg from traveling from the ovaries to the uterus. So when you get into that, that's something that's considered medically permanent. Um, so that is already problematic because now we've left the realm of reversible things. Um, I am told that Rev. Hankins Atzal uh, was not in favor of these things, although he felt that it was comparatively better than surgery uh, in our hierarchy of options. And that's where we go last, are the surgical methods for a woman, tubal ligation, uh, for a man, uh, a vasectomy. And those are really only for the most drastic of cases. They're generally considered to be medically permanent, although there are possibilities in some cases of reversal. And as I brought on the sheet in... Source number seven from the Yoetza website, they're generally speaking prohibited. If we're talking about danger to health, if we're talking about life and death issues, all bets are off. But really, these are last resort. That's, that's uh, what I'd want to express there. Okay, that's in terms of this section, which brings me to part three of our conversation as Rivka outlined it. And that is what I like to think of as legitimizing the conversation. So Rabbi Mazer, as our host, um, this is where I would like the poll, please, if uh, if you're able to produce that. I can't actually see whether the poll is going or not. Okay, so I don't know if the poll, ah, it is on, Rabbi Mazer says. Okay, check. So if you could just give people a few seconds, I'm going to say out loud what the uh, the poll question is. Is it legitimate to, number one, um, take finances like school tuition into consideration when deciding whether to have more children? Number two, is it legitimate to take physical and mental stress involved in raising children into consideration? And number three, is it legitimate to take personal preferences into consideration? I want or I don't want. Okay, Rabbi Mazer, can we conclude the poll, please? And if there's a way to let me know the results. I feel like I need the Jeopardy music. Uh, people still answering, Rabbi Mazer says. Okay. All right. We'll give them a moment. This doesn't count towards the 15 minutes I have for this section. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, here we go. Okay. So we have, it looks like 5% saying that it's legitimate to take finances like school tuition into consideration. We have, it looks like 80% taking the stress of raising children into consideration. And we have 15% saying personal preferences can be taken into consideration. That's very interesting to me. I would not have expected to see more people accept personal preferences than accept school tuition. 
Of course, school tuition tends to shape personal preferences, but that's another note. Okay. Well, thank you for answering. I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, to me, the first critical question to consider in the conversation is, are we entitled to have this conversation in the first place? From an emotional and psychological standpoint, is it all right to say, like Rivka said before, I don't want to have more children? Is that is that okay? And I leave that to Rivka for the discussion in, in part four. Um, from the perspective of halacha, from the perspective of Jewish law and Jewish belief, is it valid to say, I know this is what we call a mitzvah rabbah, a really, really important mitzvah, as Rivka outlined, but I don't want to do it. And that's what I want to address here. Now, again, I want to emphasize, we're talking about a case in which the couple has already fulfilled the mitzvot that Rivka outlined in part one. Whatever our threshold is that you have to fulfill, they've already fulfilled that. Um, we're also talking about where they're taking a halachic method of stopping that is considered optimal. Let's say they're using pills. So is it legitimate to even say, I want to stop? So I'm going to divide that into two different areas. First, are there halachically valid reasons to refrain from having children? And then is I don't want to a halachically valid reason? So in terms of are there halachically valid reasons to refrain from having children, the answer is yes. Um, so much so that some of these reasons will even override the mitzvot of pruravu, of procreation, l'shevet, you know, al-tanach, and all of that. Um, example number one, the easiest example, Concern for health. There is a lot of halachic literature regarding cases in which we have concern for mental health issues for the parents, issues that make parenting challenging or even dangerous. I brought you in source number eight on the sheet, a classic response from Rosha Feinstein. Um, I'm going to read out my English translation as opposed to reading out the Hebrew. You can see the original as well. Regarding a woman who became irrational after the birth of her two children, such that the doctors forbid further pregnancy, may she use obstructive contraception as opposed to pills and so on. And Rabbi Feinstein says, certainly his honor, the person who wrote to him, is correct. Irrationality is dangerous not only for herself, but also for her small children. Even one whose irrationality does not currently incline toward harm could still change. Wanting to harm herself or her children, God forbid, one cannot stand guard for this. Therefore, one should permit her to use obstructive contraception where there is a concern for her mental stability. Rabbi Feinstein was willing to endorse contraception. How long should it be used? Is it spacing? Is it stopping? A good discussion. Not the point right now. Highly subject to the question of what type of mental illness she's suffering from and when it might go away, when it might not. Another concern under health is the health of the child. I hope to come back to that in part five when we talk about when halacha obligates a person to stop. In other words, concern for things like genetic diseases that might be passed along. I'm going to come back to those at the end, I hope. Beyond concern for health, we also have concern for pain. I brought you in source number nine, the story that Rivka referred to, the story of Yehudit and Rabbi Chia, in which Yehudit wants to stop having children and acts towards that because of the pain of childbirth. The Ritva, Rabbi Yom Tevelasvili, commenting on that Gemara, makes very clear there was no threat to her life in having children. It was a matter of the pain of childbirth. She didn't want it, and that was considered legitimate cause to stop. I brought you a very interesting response in source number 10. There's a whole story behind this one. This is from Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. He was approached by a man who was getting married, and he felt it would be hard for him to raise children. He was sick, and he wanted to know, could he marry a woman with a condition that, that she should not become pregnant? They should engage in relations in such a way that she can't become pregnant. And Rabbi Feinstein said, absolutely not. He was not sympathetic to the man's concerns about the man's abilities, but along the way, he said, if it's the woman who has an illness or if there's a woman who is in pain, that's a different story. The mother's pain and suffering, he said, is enough to say not to pursue having children. Rav Asher Weiss in his Minchas Asher, um, Aleph Samach Tess brings this as well, um, also in an article in the 21st volume of uh, Yeshurun. This is, this is a potential reason as well. What about concern for resources of money and time to support the existing family, as well as the newborn? As Rivka mentioned, you need to invest in raising your children. What if you don't have the resources to do that and to also take care of the next child? 
So outside of the realm of reproduction, we certainly do take resources of time and money into consideration. There's a classic Gemara and Yuma, which I brought you in source number 11, which emphasizes, God is concerned about our financial assets. He doesn't want us to uh, to squander them. He doesn't want us to lose them. And there are many sources you can bring to support that. There's a Gemara in Avodah Zarah, Gimel Amid Beis, in a Kaddish Baruch Hu Babetrinya, in Briosav. Hashem does not play gotcha games with us. He doesn't look to make things difficult for us and then say, ha, why didn't you fulfill my mitzvah? Um, we even have a cap on how much we have to spend on a mitzvah. That's going to come up in the uh, in the last section. Having said that, I do have to note that those are valid concerns in other areas of halacha. When you deal with reproduction, halachic authorities tend to be less likely to accept this argument. And maybe that's why only 5% were willing to accept this. Baruch Shekivanu, we apparently uh, realized this. The Chavetz Chaim has a remarkable uh, uh, um, essay in Machne Yisrael. He's dealing with a situation in which the, the government was taking young men into the army. They had to serve from age 21 to age 27. And as a result, they would delay marriage until they were 27. And the Chafetz Chaim's argument was that they should actually marry earlier and they should even produce children. And the argument was made, really? So the mother is going to have to raise the children while he's away for, for six years in the army? What happens if he doesn't make it back? And uh, and his answer was to quote what I brought you in source number 12, Medrash from Tana Devei Eliyahu, that in Egypt, the Jews continued to produce children even as they were suffering as slaves. And he says, if they could do it under those circumstances, we can do it under uh, under under these. The um, he was not so sympathetic. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein um, also, along the same lines, in the same response in number ten, um, was not so sympathetic to the argument of inability to uh, to support the kids. That's that's their position. And here again, I come back to what I said in the beginning of my remarks about not wanting to be insensitive. And it's hard when I can't see people's faces. Um, but I I'm trying to present as accurately as possible what I understand uh, from the sources that I'm, uh, that I'm seeing. Understanding that if the family lacks resources, the current children will suffer and the child who's coming will, uh, will suffer. This is all within the halakhically valid reasons or potentially halakhically valid reasons not to, uh, pr to pursue further children. What about the statement of, I simply don't want to? Now, remember, we're talking about people who are halakhically exempt and they're not violating prohibitions in their, in their mechanism and so on. So we can bring arguments to say that I don't want to is invalid. We can show that. Um, there's a Gemara in Yuma, it's a classic in source number 13, which says, based on a pasuk in Sefer Bereshit, the text says that Abraham listened to God's voice and he guarded mitzvotai, chukotai, v'torotai. He guarded, God says, my mitzvot, my statutes, my torot. So the Gemara says that means that Abraham and not only Abraham, but Sarah and their immediate descendants observed all of the mitzvot. Now, we could have a fascinating discussion on what exactly that looked like. What did they discuss at the Seder that, uh, that Avram and Sarah held and so on? But the point that the Gemara is trying to stress for us is that they accepted mitzvot in which they were not obligated. Voluntary acceptance of mitzvot is important in Judaism. We're supposed to want more mitzvot even when we've fulfilled our obligation already, just out of love of God. Rav Aaron Lichtenstein emphasized this in source number 14, part of an essay of his. Uh, Rav Aaron was, was approached by a Bnei Akiva youth group wanting to hold a tiul, a trip, during Chol HaMoed Sukkot. And their argument was, we're exempt from the sukkah because we are traveling on the road. So we don't have an obligation to, uh, to, to sit in the sukkah. And we gain all the benefits of having the kids tour the land of Israel, develop love of the land. And this is the best time for it because the kids are off from school. And Rav Aaron emphasized in the piece that I brought you here in source number 14, that we really want to teach our children enthusiasm for mitzvot. Yes, we're exempt, but we want to pursue the mitzvah. And this again speaks to the fact that even if we're exempt, we want more mitzvot. We even have halachic frameworks for exceeding our obligations. Rav Asher Weiss, I brought you in source number 15, talks about Ratzon HaTorah, the spirit of the law. 
God wants you to do things, even if you may be exempt. And that plays out in halachic categories. In relations between human beings and each other, we have categories like lifnim bishurat hadin, transcending the letter of the law, transcending our legal obligations in the way we relate, we relate to each other. In terms of our relationship with God, ben Adam Lamakom, we have the category of the Baal Nefesh. I brought you an example of it in source number 16, where we say that even if, you could do something, you could choose to do something. Sometimes it's better to say, I am a Baal Nefesh, a person of strength, a person of spirit, and I'm going to refrain. So this argument for love of the mitzvot and taking on mitzvot would seem to argue that you shouldn't say, I don't want to do it. However, there's a flip side. There's always a flip side. This is Judaism after all. So first of all, in terms of saying you should want more mitzvot, yeah, but you're exempt. You already, and it's not even exempt, you fulfilled the mitzvah. You already had however many you needed to have. It's not like you haven't pursued it. It's not like you haven't fulfilled it. And in terms of saying, well, there is this concept of Ratzon HaTorah, this is what you know God wants. Ultimately, God left that unspecified. He left that to you as an option. He gave you a, uh, a cap and said, this is what you're obligated to do. Rav Soloveitchik in source number 17 from his book, Halachic Morality, and uh, a remarkable essay speaks to the fact that when you talk about the style of religious life, not the standard, the legal standard, but the style of religious life, the elements of it where, where you get to choose, he says it's subjective. And it's each person and what's right for them, their manner, their style, their personality. And so much of Judaism is left that way. We think of major overarching commands like to be holy or to do that which is right and good. These are left to us to uh, to determine. I mentioned the Baal Nefesh, the idea that someone will try to do more if they are a Baal Nefesh. Okay, but the very fact that certain things are in the category of Baal Nefesh, these are for special people, says that they're not for everybody. The uh, That's just the truth. Even if Nimmi Shurat Hadin, going beyond the letter of the law, is not an unlimited thing, as Tosvos notes in source number 18. Finally, on this point, exceeding going beyond one's obligations can sometimes be destructive. There's an important passage in the Jerusalem Talmud, I brought it in source number 19, in which Rabbi Elazar says, just as one may not declare the Tameh to be Tahor, so one may not declare the Tahor to be Tameh. Or to use the language of the Shach, a classic commentary to the Shulchan Aruch, to the Code of Jewish Law, he says, just as we may not permit the prohibited, so we may not prohibit the permitted. That's a very, very important principle because all sorts of bad things happen when we start just piling on stringencies and saying, well, let's just keep on adding and let's keep on doing. It's something you have to really be careful about. So to sum up what I've said in what I hope was 15 minutes, Rivka, um, I, I forgot to watch the clock, um, but, but basically I'm trying to address the question of whether it's right to have this conversation. And I think it really is. Um, I think it should be done carefully, as Rivka is going to discuss. I think it should be done consulting with a halachic authority. But number one, there are halachically valid reasons to refrain health, pain, possibly even resources. And even saying, I don't want to, may indeed have its place. I'm going to come back in the last section to talk about the times when halacha actually says that you have to stop. Um, speaking of having to stop, Rivka, your turn. <laughs> Thank you. And I think I think you kept your time better than I did. So I certainly have no complaints, but I will try to uh, I'll try to get through mine so that we have time for questions at the end. So the psychology of making the decision again, remember that as sophisticated and complex as we humans are, we're not entirely in control of the results of our decisions, only of making the best decisions that we can under the circumstances. So why is this such a difficult decision? Well, it's a difficult decision because it's a genuine conflict between two values. If I had one value and it was conflicting with a preference, I wouldn't have a difficult decision to make. But because there are two equally important values and those two values are in conflict with each other, that's when we have trouble. And those two values could be in conflict between Rabbi Chia and Yehudit. It could be in, in conflict bet, you know, between the two of us, but it could also actually be oftentimes an, an inner conflict that I have where I myself am struggling with something that I you know, that I both want and don't want. So I want to acknowledge that it's not a simple question. It's not a simple conversation. 
even or especially with the person you love and trust the most. These conversations bring to light some of our most deeply held convictions and inner conflicts. Now, many of us have a, this magic number in our head. You know, when you were a kid or a teenager and you imagined yourself being a grown up, you know, and you thought about, you know, the, the bright eyed, bushy tailed children around the Shabbos table, did you imagine two or 10, right? We all had some sort of number in our head. And I think that's something that influences our decision. Our perspectives are shaped by our own experiences growing up, by our own uh, education, by the by our peer group, how many children were in the family of my best friend, and therefore two people who had different experiences growing up, different parenting styles, different enrichment opportunities, are going to have different ideas of the ideal family size. The other thing to consider, and just sort of put this in the back of your head somewhere, is that sometimes we feel under pressure from our parents who haven't had their magic number and are hoping to somehow um, make up for that through us. So it's also important not only to take into our account our, our own conflicts, but to realize that there are other pressures and influences as well. Another reason it feels so complex is that it reflects a tension. And, and I loved what you said before about, you know, this is Judaism after all, we love holding two different things at once. And there's a tension between the individual and the community. So this is reflected in a, in a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe responding to a question about birth control, where he says, you know, on the one hand, every Jewish person is responsible to the entire Jewish nation. And of course, bringing more children, growing the Jewish nation is a community responsibility. Um, and this, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe doesn't include this, but actually the, one of the Gemars in, in Yevamot says that Mashiach can't come until all the souls have been born into this world. So every baby is bringing us closer to the Messiah. I mean, what could be more important for the Jewish people? On the other hand, says the Lubavitcher Rebbe, your health, the individual's health and safety is part of your religious obligation. And so the, the obligation to the community and the obligation to the individual are sometimes in conflict. So this, the halacha stays the same, but our, our situation is unique. So, you know, and, and again, some of the conflict that I mentioned in the stories, you might feel like you're a bad Jew because you know that, that children are this high Jewish value, even though the halacha is not necessarily demanding it of you, but somehow you feel there's a conflict there, or perhaps you feel you should be able to raise a large number of perfectly healthy, well-adjusted, polite, clean children, while also, you know, working outside the home, volunteering for Beaker Holim, taking care of aging parents, using only non-disposable diapers, making your own organic baby food, you know, I think we have to be realistic about what it takes to raise a happy, healthy Jewish child. Yes, it's a lot, but it's not that much, right? So we, I think one of the things I'm going to suggest is that speaking to a mentor, speaking to a rabbi, speaking to a friend who's a little bit ahead of you on the road can really help you in assessing you know, what your want and what your need is and what a child's want and need is. So remember that children, just like marriage, are a process. So just people spend a year planning their wedding and then think that they don't need to plan for the marriage after that. That's it. We're done planning. But in fact, you know, marriage takes work. It takes planning. And a child is more than just a decision to conceive. The, con the conversations about your marriage and about the number of children you wanna have are ongoing conversations. They're not one-time decisions, right? And for example, if let's say finances were holding you back or, or resources, right? And then you win the lottery. Well, your situation has changed and you might actually decide, yes, let's have another child. So I think it's, it's honest to assess on an ongoing basis and say, right now the answer is no. But that's different from saying the answer is never from now on. And I, when my situation changes in whatever way it changes, I'll reassess. The answer might stay the same. It's quite possible that no is still the best answer for me. But it's something that I'm honestly in, interacting with and, and, um, and considering. It's not deciding not to decide. So I wanna thank a dear friend and mentor, Robbie Hertz Schwartz. And uh, she's also a very compassionate and talented therapist for some of these ideas and tips that she helped me talk through. Um, so things that you wanna ask yourself, are you or your children, your current children, dealing with any diagnosed or undiagnosed mental health challenges? What are the reasons each of you does or doesn't want to have another child? What are the pros and cons of adding another child to your family? What will happen to the dynamics? And what will it do what will, impact will it have on your relationship with your spouse? Remember that it's all fine and good to long to see Jimmy holding his new baby sister, but what is that gonna do 
to your relationship with your spouse because that is the foundation. The healthy marriage is vital for children. And so that has to be taken into account as well. Any difficult conversation like this, which is so fraught with emotion, it is vital to have good communication skills. Otherwise, people can get backed into a corner, say something they don't really mean, but then feel like they have to defend it and stick to it. It's just never a good idea. So the first suggestion that I want to make is make an appointment. Let your spouse know you want to talk about it. Don't surprise them with a conversation like this. Set multiple times. This is an ongoing process. It's not an emergency. You don't have to make the decision today. Make sure when you get together to say, is this still a good time for you? Number two, in any conversation that is difficult, emotional, it's really helpful to use reflective listening and listen to understand rather than respond, is, which is what we usually do. So you're going to ask things like, do you mean, and then you're going to rephrase to make sure that you actually did understand what they meant. Or let me see if I understand. Are you saying those two sentences can make a world of difference in communication? Number three, pause. If you feel yourself getting triggered or defensive, again, the last thing you want to do is paint yourself into a corner and then feel like you have to stick with this, this, this statement that you made under pressure. So say, I'm feeling really upset, I need a break. Generally, and this is a, a strategy I think that the Gottmans recommend, take a break generally around 20 minutes is long enough for you to calm down, but not long enough that you forget your, what you were talking about. Sometimes by then you're already driving carpool or you know living life, but if you can get back to it within 24 hours, that's generally best. Number four, and this relates to the question you know we brought up before, think about your team. How much help can you count on? Really, what resources do you have? Is your spouse available and willing to pitch in? Do you have parents, in-laws, siblings nearby? What's your relationship with them? What kind of community do you live in? What are its unspoken rules? Will they support you or hindering you or hinder you in creating the family that you want? Can you hire a nanny, a neighbor, a nephew? You don't have to do it all and you don't have to do it perfectly. And number five, this strategy comes from therapist Anne Davidman, who specializes in helping people make a decision about ha having children. Now, she she talks about whether you should have children at all, but I think that the strategy is a really, really interesting technique. And what she recommends is that you, let's say the decision is yes, we wanna have more children. No, we don't. And you don't know which one it is. When you're talking, you're flipping, you're flip-flopping between yes and no, and it's hard to really get a sense of how you really, what your reaction is. If you don't have an immediate gut reaction that's very different to one of them, it's really hard to assess. So what she says is make a decision in your head, one of them, choose one of them, say yes, and live with that for a week. And every day you wake up and you're like, yes, we're gonna have more kids. And over the course of that week, write down what that brings up for you, write down what that triggers for you. And the next week, decide no. And again, for the week, write down what that brings up for you, what that means, what that feels like. And that gives you a chance to really sit with the decision for long enough to actually analyze and, and grow with it and see what makes sense for you. The, re the, overar the overarching question is, are you making this decision, decision from love and trust or out of fear? And uh, Shana Goldberg, one of the Yotzot, I caught the tail end of her amazing session about decision making for teens in the high school track today. And she's, she's written a whole book about making decisions. So you have to really think about where you're coming from. Know yourself is always gonna be the first, um, the first rule. And think in years, not days. It can really be helpful to frame the decision about having more children in the same way that we frame other decisions about Jewish values, right? And that's where Rabbi Torchiner has given us an abundance of sources. But think about how do we make decisions about the relative importance of living in a religious neighborhood, of a Jewish paying for a Jewish education or paying down my mortgage or sending my kids to Jewish camps. Those are all in, you know, they might not have the same level <laughs> of, um, of importance as the mitzvah of having children certainly we're talking about a level where you've already fulfilled that right so how do you make those decisions about jewish values how do you balance the needs right and and those are the kind of conversations that we want to have in order to then take the next step to really speak to a halachic authority and try to tease out what that looks like um halachically legally rabbi i want to pass back the the torch so that you can finish the conversation about does halacha ever demand that you stop? 
Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Ilan posted two questions in the chat. I'm gonna take the one that relates to me. Um, and that is, could I clarify what I said regarding IUD being a less preferable option as opposed to birth control pills? Um, so my understanding is that the birth control pills are preferable because they're not by definition as long lasting as the IUD is, where you're talking about three to five years. Um, but um, Rivka, I don't know if you wanna speak to that at all. From, you know, from from your knowledge? And so you're absolutely right. Um, the pill is immediately reversible, et cetera, et cetera. The IUD is also not felt, so it doesn't interfere with, with normal relations. I, I don't think anybody considers that an issue. Uh, well, there are, of course, some people who feel that the, the health risks and the, the cumulative risk of being on the pill for longer is also a consideration. So it really would depend on your specific health situation and, uh, and it'd be worth a conversation. Right. Okay. Thank you. So just to briefly discuss the issue of when Halacha tells you to stop, and this will just be for a few minutes, and then we can take more questions. And Rivka, there's a question on there uh, in the chat for you. Um, so basically, the issue is, at some points, we're not supposed to take risks by having more children. Number one, if there is a mortal risk to the mother's health, Rav Yitzchak Weiss, the Minchas Yitzchak, who was actually the posting for Shari Tzedek Hospital for, for quite a while um, in the 20th century, um, dealt with a question in which there was a woman for whom the doctor said it could be fatal for her to produce more children, for her to conceive and uh, try to produce more children, but she wanted to try and so Rabbi Weiss, in source number 20, this little excerpt from his answer, Mama Hani Ritzona Baze MD Nahachi, says, what does the patient's desire have to do with this? He says, it, yeah, you're not allowed to endanger yourself, and, and therefore you're not allowed to, uh, to choose pregnancy. So the, not to mention, by the way, a threat to her health is a threat to the health of the children she's going to produce and have to raise, but that's its own point. Um, but what about the more thorny question about where there is a risk of birth defects for the child? And of course, birth defects is a big place. There's a, quite a range that's included within that. But what I wanted to show you is that when we talk about trying to have a child naturally, by which I mean not with pre-GD, pre pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Without that, just trying to have the child naturally, the halachic rulings are all over the place. Right? Moshe Feinstein, I brought him in source number 21, the Tzitzeliezer, Rebbe Eliezer Waldenberg, um, both uh, address this. And um, Rabbi Feinstein's position was that, no, nope, they should continue to try to have children. He didn't have PGD. That didn't exist uh, back when he was writing. He passed away in 1986. But he says, you pursue having children and daven for the best. He was dealing with a case in which they expected a 50% chance of a pretty severe um, set of health problems for the child. Roshlomo Zalman Arbach, and I brought it here in source number 22. I only brought my translation. Not sure why I didn't bring the Hebrew. I don't know. But in any case, in uh, in source number 22, Roshlomo Zalman uh, Orbach says that there is um, the that there is no mitzvah of pursuing children naturally where you expect that there will be such defects and problems for the uh, for the child. Um, he pointed out that we have this idea that there's a cap on what you have to spend to fulfill a mitzvah. And he said the pain they would have is far greater than, uh, than that. So he said, um, there's no mitzvah. Then he said, on the other hand, maybe you could argue there is a mitzvah because the Gemara says you're not supposed to in interfere with God's plans. So he kind of hedges. And then you have Rav Asher Weiss in the Minchas Asher, which I brought you in source number 23, Rabbi Aryeh Katz in an article in Truman in source number 24, who say absolutely not. The um, Rabbi Weiss dealt with a case in which the parents were both carriers of a recessive gene for a disease. And he said, you're not allowed to cause such pain to the child. Rav Nachum Rabinovich, Allah Shalom, in the Siach Nachum said the same. Um, Rav Aryeh Katz said, we live in a world with the option of PGD. And therefore, he said, you can't try to have a child naturally where you know that you have this kind of level of, uh, of risk. What about PGD saying, well, now we have that. Is there an obligation to go that route? So Rav Asher Weiss, Minchas Asher, the same shuva that I brought you here, it's in number 25. Um, dealt with a case in which there were parents who were both carriers of a recessive gene for a disease. And he said, there's no obligation to pursue PGD, but it will be good to encourage them to do so. 
um, Rabbi Dr. Avram Steinberg in Harafua Kahalacha also promotes PGD for it. But the bottom line out of this is that there are many halachic authorities who say that where there's a real chance that we're talking about serious birth defects for the child, one should not try naturally. There isn't an obligation to try the PGD route. And there are all sorts of halachic questions about how to do PGD, which are beyond the scope of our discussion. But at the same time, uh, Rav Asher Weiss felt it should be uh, it should be encouraged. The um, that's what I would uh, what I would say on that. Rivka, back to you. All for right. As we as we as we close out our hour, I, we just wanted to close with the words of the Yukum Purkan prayer that we say on Shabbat. May we be blessed with Zara Chaya Vekayama offspring that live and survive, offering who don't stop learning Torah and who don't neglect the words of the Torah. It's been an honor and a privilege to give this session with you. And I, I hope that we can answer, you know, one or two questions, even though we're a little bit over time. And then for the rest, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you again to the sponsors. And thank you, of course, to our secret host behind the, behind the scenes. We're not over yet. That clock is fast. We, ah. It started during the time countdown. We have another ah. minute or two. Great. So okay. you take, so then you let's take we get question? to question number two. The truth is I don't have a, have a great answer. Um, the question was, what's the required number of children that we've, we've been referring to? Like, oh, you've already fulfilled your obligation. So now you're in a different category. But the, the truth is that it's actually a little bit more complicated. So everybody agrees on the basic do-o-ra-ita, on the pru or vu being one boy and one girl. Um, then there's some disagreement. There's a bit of, of a range in terms of what it means to do la, la erev and la shevet, the next two levels. Uh, whether it's one more child, two more child, does it matter which gender? And the truth is that we can't always we can't always know whether we're going to fulfill any of them um, because we might have you know three girls or three boys, right? In in which case, um, many opinions would would hold that it's not up to us that. We've done our best to uh, to certainly be busy with pru or vu, um, and hopefully the next generation will allow us to fulfill our obligation. So I guess the the short answer is it's not always clear, and so again, speaking to a lachic authority so that you can sort of wend your way through the various opinions would be really helpful. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank um, you so I much. echo. I echo Rivka's bracha, and uh, as Rivka said in the beginning, if you want to contact us by email afterwards, that's certainly uh, that's certainly fine as well.